the furlough. Um, but great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And Anne from Newry Street. Yes, Anne Fitzpatrick. In Hi, Joanne McDowell, and uh, I work for the fundraising regulator here in Northern Ireland, the manager here. Lovely to see you all. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Brona Trainer from Morn Stimulus Day Centre. Um, I'm the fundraiser there. Thank you, Sean. Sean, you're on mute. There. Oh. <coughs> Sorry, um, my name is Sean Moore and I'm um, a community development worker with the Confederation of Community Groups in Uri. Um Currently working from home. Uh, I work, <coughs> fund, funding is a big part of my job, so that's why I want to join this session this morning. Thanks very much. Una? Una, you're on mute. Hello. I'm uh, Una from Samaritans and I'm the fundraising coordinator. Can I just say, I can't see everybody. I can only see six people, well, five people and myself. Is that normal? Is that? Yes, I think it is normal. If, you, if you're viewing everyone, you'll, just have to, you'll see a little arrow on the right hand side and the left hand side and you just have to spool across um, and then you'll be able to see other people's faces as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah. lovely. Great. Um, the next person I can see is Jack. Hi, uh, I'm Jack. I'm the Outreach and Volunteering Officer for the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Thank you. And then I've got someone from Fermanagh Trust. Do you want to introduce yourself? No. Nadine, do you want to introduce yourself again? Uh, hi everybody, hi I'm Nadine Campbell here, a chair of the Chartered Institute of Fundraising and just here to kind of sit in with Paul. We're a voluntary committee who represent fundraisers across the UK and Northern Ireland and in my day job I'm head of fundraising at EHNI. Thank you. And then the person from Hope for Life, do you want to say good morning? Yeah, good morning, uh, Campbell Hamilton. I'm the um, Relationship Development Officer at Hope for Life. Thanks, Campbell. That's great. Matt? Um, hi, I'm, I'm Matt. I'm part of the Chartered Institute of Fundraising as well, and I'm also the Community Fundraising Manager for Concern Worldwide. Thank you. Greta, good morning. Hi, I'm Greta Thompson. I'm the Operations Manager for Clare CIC. Thanks, Greta. Heather? Can't hear you. No, no, we still can't hear you. Do you want me to come back to you in a wee second? Um, Moira? Do you want to say good morning? Moira, I think you're on mute. Down the bottom left, left of your screen, you should see the mic. There you go. Hi, my name's Maura Wiley. I'm from the Clare Project uh, in North Belfast. I'm here with my colleague, Greta Thompson. Thanks, Maura. That's lovely. And Rosie, good morning. Do you want to introduce yourself to the group? No. Is anybody else wanting to say good morning who hasn't spoken already before I um, introduce our first speaker? No. Grant, well, look, you're all very welcome. And um, I wonder if you want to just put your microphones on mute when you're not speaking. It would probably be useful because it cuts down on the echo that, that we would hear. Um, so uh, Volunteer Now has convened a number of these little sessions over the last number of weeks just to try and um, start kind of thinking differently about volunteering. Um, we're conscious that there's been such changes in 
our community life and everything uh, uh, that we do over the last number of weeks. We've seen a, a huge upsurge in the number of people who've come forward to help during the pandemic, but we also know And now people are beginning to think, how can we get community back to whatever a new normal looks like? And we are well aware that lots of things will have to change as a result of that. I mean, clearly the issues around social distancing, um, infection control measures, um, all of those kinds of things will mean that volunteering as we knew it may not be back with us for some time. Um, we also have to think about perhaps new rules, new ways of doing things, um, managing things online instead of having face-to-face -face meetings. And there will also be big changes in who is volunteering. Many organisations, probably even around the table this morning, have relied on perhaps older people as volunteers. And those older people may not be as available as they were. They may be nervous about coming back out again. They may be um, interested in, uh, you know, they may need to continue shielding for their own health issues or you may potentially also have issues with your insurance company, not picking up insurance for volunteers who are over 70, but that landscape is still very much emerging, I would say, from uh, the pandemic itself. Um, so those are just some of the, the kind of issues that we, we knew were, were out there. So we wanted just to put uh, together a series of online conversations so that people could come together, share experiences, and just begin to sort of plan for the future. I mean, there's, there, this today is not really about solutions, it's about just trying to scope up the environment and begin to see how other people are thinking and, and just explore what some of the issues are in, in this space. And today we're looking at thinking about volunteering for fundraising again. Um, so I... And Dan McDowell from the fundraising regulator is going to say a few words to start with. And then we're going to ask um, Paul and Nadine from, and Matt from the Institute of Fundraising just to share a little bit about their experiences over the last little while. And then we'll open the floor just for com comments and conversation. Um, and we'll aim to finish by 12. If you have questions or thoughts or anything, just um, please feel free. There's a little kind of speech bubble on the top right hand side of the screen, and that's the chat. Um, and um, uh, you can you can put a question in the chat at any stage and my colleague Jane is going to keep an eye on the chat and then she'll be able to feed through those questions into the discussion at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to ask Joanne if she would um, say a few words this morning just on behalf of the fundraising regulator. No problem, Denise. Thank you very much. Um, um, it's, it's great to see, see you all. Um, I suppose what I'm going to do today is just give a high level overview and then hopefully we'll get into more discussion. Um, as a regulator in these times, um, we are absolutely recognising how it is un so uncertain for people who continue to work. Um, our main aim has been to protect donors and help charities do whatever work they're in able to engage in, particularly around their fundraising activity. Um, so we've looked at how we can remain proportionate um, and acknowledge that charities are doing things differently and therefore some of the fundraising guidance that we have available is now being used by different sets of people. I mean, a few people have already said within their own organisations that structures are changing quite dramatically um, and therefore we find ourselves being a vehicle to share that information more widely. I mean, the code of practice that you'll all, um, I'm sure, be very aware of is very much the regulatory framework we have to continue to work with. But um, what we're doing within that is encouraging people to use it as a point of reference and then get in touch with us around the specific queries they may have or colleagues may have around what they're planning to do or what they're able to do. Um, as the change, as Denise has already highlighted, the changes changes that are happening around government requirements and also around social distancing mean that we're continuing um, to encourage organisations to weigh up the benefits of risks and risks of any ongoing fundraising activity, and making sure that they exercise their own judgment around those, particularly around the beneficiaries and and the staff and the volunteers involved. With the easing of lockdown, um, we've been working very clearly with partners around what would be the best and most suitable guidance around fund, how, we're, how 
organisations are able to restart some of their fundraising activity. And that's where we've actually been working with um, the Chartered Institute of Fundraising um, to put together some more guidance on face-to-face -face activity. Folks, that's still in draft. Um, so what we've been doing is engaging with a different range of people right the way across the UK to, to make sure that that will actually fit. But we're not going to push the button on that guidance until um, we're very clear about um, what the next step would mean for people around that. Um, so it will probably be a work in progress around that, like all of our guidance, it will be updated regularly. So what I wanted to encourage people to do today was to think about um, registering with us um, for the newsletter to make sure they get regular updates around that if they haven't already, but equally as well to, to look on our hub within the website because that's where we'll put any updated information. But we will actually be working very closely with the Chartered Institute of Fundraising to make sure we get that broadly out um, to people around, around the UK who are working in that area. The other thing we've been doing is working um, with, again, in partnership with a charity retail association, particularly for anybody who's thinking about reopening of um, retail shops. And there's some very specific guidance from um, the Charity Retail Association, which I think is really helpful around linking in to what, what, you, what is possible there. It'd be important to go on and have a look at that as well. So practically a lot of what we've been doing has been signposting guidance, guiding people, particularly to section five of the code, which is around the work with volunteers. I mean, that still stands, folks. It hasn't changed that much, but it is just a reminder of practical steps around that. We've been encouraging people to build up activities and phase back into activities so that they can learn as much as possible for those and to keep in touch with those. Denise has already referenced this as well, guys, um, particularly in the code sections one and two, um, which are around behaviours and practical ways of working. I'd suggest that everybody re-familiarises themselves with those because as you're all very aware, Everyone is very different. Individuals will have different concerns and be raising different issues now. So it's very much thinking about how volunteers um, and fundraisers can respond to those, but to review on an ongoing basis as well is crucial around that. Um, and sadly, from a regulatory perspective, that's where it comes back to being really um, clear about how uh, both fundraisers and volunteers would um, signpost people to complaints as well, because we do think that there's a genuine um, quid pro quo around that, that people will be more concerned around that, and we're starting to see it already. Some of you may have seen that in terms of the publication of some of our investigations, and um, there, there are some ongoing concerns then. I mean, they're not any different from from the usual folks, I need to be, I need to stress that, but probably people who are more nervous about individual contact, about bag drops, about practical things like that, are now going to start to raise those again. And we've certainly, on the complaint side of things, seen a very small rise in that, but they are around practical engagement. And as you've as you referenced as well, Denise, it's particularly around older people around that who are slight, who are more nervous around the transition and um, into what becomes the new norm around that. We've also put together some guidance around appeals. As you'll all be more aware than everybody within society now, appeals pop up and are ongoing all the time. So we've been encouraging um, people, particularly members of the public, to read our guidance around appeals. Um, and again, Volunteer Now has very kindly circulated that guidance out to members, but it still remains key to thinking about how um, relevant individual campaigns are and how people can work with existing charities is the push within that guidance. We've also as well looked at safer giving. There's obviously the issues around fraud that have always been there, but we've raised the profile of that. And again, our guidance on crowdfunding platforms are the other two areas that we're seeing more kind of interest in uh, and more kind of ongoing contact with. Um, but overall, what we what we would really be encouraging people to do is to contact us directly. Um, there's a couple of ways of doing that because as more mechanisms emerge, as people think creatively about how they might be able to fundraise in the future, it's wor always worthwhile checking in with us around that. So again, those kind of questions and answers that come up. 
And again, that's been across teams for us here in Northern Ireland. I've certainly taken an, an increased number of queries from different people who are now getting involved. And as always, there's a little bit more of a query around lotteries and raffles in Northern Ireland because the guidance is, is not as clear on that. Um, and there's a number of organisations who've been using those kind of mechanisms. So folks, that's a really quick run through of the kind of things we've been doing as the regulator across the UK and here in Northern Ireland. Um, and we are being very clear that the guidance will have to be different for each of the nations across the UK. So the links and the and the how we link into government requirements around social distancing will all have to be very clear. There'll be guiding principles across the UK, but we'll get into the devil of the detail for each of the countries because as we're all aware, each of those is very different at the moment. Okay. Joanne, thanks. That's great. Um, I think that's a really good overview. Um, I think if we have colleagues from the Institute of Fundraising now, and then we'll do a general question section, I think, towards the end. So I'm not sure who wants to go first, whether it's Nadine or Paul or Matt. Uh, I'll just chip in there first, uh, Joanne. Thanks very much for uh, an overview there. It was good to kind of get a bit of a broad overview in terms of what the fundraising regulator is doing. And, and I think we're all appreciative that obviously when you have a UK wide um, body, you know, there are nuances that each each kind of different nation has. And uh, the Chartered Institute of Fundraising is exactly the same. Um, I had a chair's phone call yesterday and the Chartered Institute of Fundraising has had two surveys now with PwC um, asking the sector, you know, to respond to that survey. But ourselves in Scotland were very much, you know, the feedback was great to have this survey, but really it wasn't really applicable. The questions were not really applicable for our landscape here um, in each of our nations. So what I would say is if, if some people aren't familiar um, Chartered Institute of Fundraising ourselves teamed up with CO3 and we pulled together a survey for the sector here in Northern Ireland a few weeks ago. We are in talks that we might look to do a second one just to see if anything has changed. I mean, obviously, the, there is the, the fund now has, will open next week, which I'm sure you're all aware of, um, to release that remaining £15 million. Pounds. Um, so that's so kind of like from a from a lobbying point of view and a policy point of view, we've been working with CO3 here locally um, and with the Department for Communities to try and release that 15 million pounds as quickly as we can for local charities here in Northern Ireland. Um, what's coming over the over the hill, I suppose, is a um, on the chair's call yesterday, there was discussions around a letter will be going into the Treasury in Westminster for release perhaps something around gift aid. Um, so maybe it's accessing, you know, unclaimed gift aid. Uh, what that looks like in terms of what that's gonna come out as, I'm not sure, but there's definitely talks happening at a kind of a ministerial le level in Westminster, and then that will filter down into the nations here. Um, also as an institute, what we've done in Paul and Paul will probably be able to give a bit more insight into this. Most of our members are on furlough. Um, and I know that one of the key asks that we had put forward with the with the report with CO3 in the Department for Communities was to permit those fundraisers who are currently on furlough to be able to volunteer back into their respective organisations. Um, as to what the outcome of that conversation is, we still do not know. Um, we still don't know. Um, but I know that it is looking a little bit more favourably across the board that that is something that could potentially happen, but there's no outcome on that. Um, so really, that's kind of what I give you from the kind of top level that's coming down through, a, you know, UK Chartered Institute of Fundraising and then filtering back into us in terms of what we're doing here locally. Um, and I'll hand you over to Paul and Matt, who can probably talk about it from their perspective. You know, you've got one, Paul, who's obviously an active member on our committee, who's currently on furlough, but then um, Matt, who, like myself, has been working through this, and Matt would be similar to me, that we have a lot of older volunteers. Um, so we're kind of looking at the challenges around that too. So don't mean to put you on the spot, lads, but uh, fill your boots, talk away. Thanks, Nadine. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Paul Montgomery. Um, I normally uh, am working for the Stroke Association, 
uh, but I think it's maybe about five weeks now that I've been on furlough, which I'm sure is very common, and you will all know people who are in the same position. Um, and I suppose, first of all, the point that Nadine was making there about, about that aspect of it is that for me, I just feel a little bit of detachment from the charity, um, a little bit, uh, almost a feeling of kind of neglect of your volunteers, of your fundraisers, the people who you're, you know, in, in daily or if not weekly um, uh, contact with, and you just haven't been able to pick up the phone. Um, and so there, there's that kind of feeling, and how are we going to re-engage? Um, how am I going to rebuild those um, uh, relationships when I go back into the workplace? Um, and knowing when that's going to be is another thing. Always in the back of your mind, when's that going to be? Is it going to happen? Um, you know, that's going to be a worry for a lot of people as well. Um, but I suppose just kind of mulling over uh, the last couple of days, thinking about, okay, well, what will I be doing with regards to, to volunteers? Um, there's going to be a few different groups for me um, working in a health charity. Um, so there'll be new service volunteers, new volunteers that have come on to deliver pandemic specific services um, or support those that are ongoing but are changed. Um, and when that the demand for that drops, if it drops, um, then how can we engage those volunteers into the fundraising side of the, the charity as well? Um, in tandem, um, hopefully keeping them engaged in, in service delivery as well, because we know that those those people who are in you know in touch with the beneficiaries are the most likely to go out and, and engage in fundraising. Um, so how do we engage them and and you know, what about the existing fundraising volunteers who we had on board previously, who we've then been able to, to move in to, um, to frontline service delivery roles during the pandemic? How can we re-engage them? So it's kind of thinking about different groups there. Um, we don't so much have uh, fundraising groups, um, committees, uh, but I know that a lot of charities will do. And um, you know, from previous experience of being, say, with the NSPCC, um, the, the groups, they all, to be honest, they, they kind of look the same. They are older, older members in those groups. Um, they are more at risk. Um, and uh, Joanne mentioned before about face-to-face -face fundraising. Really welcome the idea of, of conversations between the Chartered Institute and the fundraising regulator there. We're not involved in those conversations here locally yet. Um, but uh, when we get some guidance on that, you know, how do we feel about putting uh, putting people who are more at risk um, out in front of the public, if that's possible? Um, you know, cash handling. Um, how, how are we going to? Is there going to be cash? Um, is it all going to be contactless now? And we know over the last couple of years there have been uh, a lot of trials into to tap and donate. Uh, but you know where. How are we going to, to be able to bring that on um, locally, especially here? It's not so common. You know, the, the trials have all been in the, the big population centres. Um, I know from certainly from the Stroke Association, we'd have done collections on London Bridge where you've got thousands of people um, passing by. It's not going to work on the door of ASDA. Um, so uh, uh, equally, supermarkets are very likely to, to change their position to, to, to collecting and backpacking and so on. Um, so just kind of having a think about that. And you know, then when when these people when we were able to start re-engaging people, for me, I think it's about showing the value of their input over the over this period. You know, how can we demonstrate what their actions have brought to the charity, have brought to the beneficiaries? Um, and and I'll, I'll kind of boil them back to your case for support and uh, knowing your figures, um, knowing how much it's how much has it cost to, to, to even recruit, induct, train, support a volunteer. So then they've got an idea of how much um, how much the charity invests in them may, may give an opportunity for them to start thinking about if they want to do fundraising, how much they might aim for. Um, uh, always very reluctant to talk about targets with volunteers. So it's about being careful around those those, those conversations. Um, but, but again, showing the value, thinking about the next step in their journey. Now, what that's going to be, I'll be honest, I, I don't think there's many of us who know what that's going to be yet. Um, so it's all a wee bit, suck it and see. Um, uh, but, but the importance of, 
of you know the effective management of volunteers is going to be really important. However, that management takes place, you'll have different relationships with different volunteers who like um, their support delivered in different ways. So um, it's about trying to be transparent, being available. Um, but again, this is from a detached position of me at home, uh, homeschooling um, in the garden, trying to keep my head straight um, while while on furlough, which will be really, really common right across the sector. Um, I don't know if Matt has anything to add on that. Um, cheers, Paul. Um, yeah, I've some of the things Nadine mentioned, so I've worked for Concern Worldwide, so we don't have service delivery as such because our work is overseas. So the primarily, if, if not exclusively, we my area would be fundraising volunteers. We also, one of my colleagues would also look after retail. So there is a number of volunteers there. And some of the issues remain the same. I think it's important to note for us, a lot of our volunteers are older and there are a lot of health concerns. And for me, a lot of this comes down to we're going through trauma, you know, as a nation, as a as a population, and it's sort of so for me. A lot of the focus of myself and my team have been around stewardship, I guess, but it's been around sort of making sure, just checking in how our volunteers are. It's sort of on an emotional level as well. Like I guess fundraising volunteer volunteers can be looked at. It can be sort of in its purest form transactional, in the sense that you're fulfilling a sense of altruism from the volunteer potentially, and you're retaining financial and community support and I think that has shifted the lens has shifted because of where we are but we still want to be able to fulfill that sense of altruism of their the selflessness that the volunteers have and what we've been doing is sort of we know that you know our vault fundraising was very traditional it's always been the same it's older groups that have existed for 20 30 years and they have done their street collections they have done their door to door they have done their supermarket collections and that can happen and instead of us looking just inwardly of we have lost x amount of income we're also looking at it's important to look at the volunteers who have lost not their sense of purpose that's maybe grandiose but something that the you know that they were able to do to help and sort of give them that sense of the altruism so we've sort of my sort of mindset has sort of shifted in, yes, we obviously need to raise our money, but how can we work with the fundraising volunteers so they go from being the instigators of that fundraising support to being that ambassadorial role of being a spokesperson within their community? They always were, but you know, our groups aren't very digitally savvy. You know, we spoke to them about just giving pages and online events, and that wasn't an avenue that we were going to see success in. But what we have been able to do is provide them with text content, with handwritten, posted out letters, handwritten letters that they can share with their family and friends. And we've seen third party fundraisers come to us that we hadn't done before from their younger family, their, their children, their nieces, their nephews who have come to support us, who have wanted to try and fill the gaps of that fundraising through their street collections and um, through third party fundraising. You know, um, so it's been great. So we've seen, I think what, what we tried to do is, and what's sort of been nice, actually this bizarre thing to say, nice about this pandemic for us, it's it's given us a time to really be really personal and really honed in on our stewardship, handwritten letters to our donors, handwritten letters to our volunteers, longer phone calls to see how they are. And for us, it's, it's maintaining those relations. And I just worry that some charities may worry about where the next pound is going to go. And so they move away from, the traditional door-to-door -door and their street collections and they, they instantly create 10 virtual events and they try and get the younger activists and they try and get the younger people and it's it's i just i find for me it's massively important to try not and forget that these people have supported you for so long and show them the respect they deserve for us some of the issues you know we've mentioned about reduce income a lot of our volunteers you know we are counting on the fact that a lot of these volunteers won't come back to support to support us in the traditional ways through shielding through you know just not feeling comfortable to do so the the advances of a cashless society you know when would you see street collections being allowed would we what is our sense of duty even if they are allowed to ask volunteers to go out and do that and um, even if they're willing to do so we have a sense of duty i feel to be very careful about that and what is supermarkets and as Paul said there's there's going to be a long time before we see that come back if if ever again um 
this, again, I mentioned about the shift in viewpoint. That's sort of where I am. It's stewardship is king. It always has been for fundraisers, but I think with volunteers, this is more important. I mentioned about the trauma, and I guess that's, again, I hark back. We're just sort of trying to get ourselves through it internally, but trying to also help our supporters through it, our older supporters especially, who feel particularly vulnerable, who have not been able to leave the house, you know, to show them that we care, to keep them updated, um, and not show them that they're just a cash cow that we, you know, that we want the milk um, to try and help us support and giving them the opportunity to, to show that they can use their networks to support us. So th it's actually offered us an opportunity that we've always struggled to blood in new people into our groups. It's always been the, the older groups, but what this has had, what the opportunity has had is they have been had to, to fulfill the sense of, again, the sense of altruism I keep mentioning. They've had to go to their younger networks and they've sort of had to go that way and we've been able to bring younger people in so we're just trying to steer those people gently because we know younger people don't necessarily like the sense of the fundraising group you know that that term is can be quite overarch or quite overbearing we found through research so it's just massaging those people and bringing them on to sort of support us in the longer term so i guess we're trying to shift the lens of how the volunteers get their fulfillment really and i think that's that was mainly it and I guess in regards to the future of the sort of volunteer fundraising, you know, we, we see this the movement we see the, the movement of street collections and bucket collections to social movement and collectivism fundraising and volunteering. Um that has become such a big thing. So for us we're trying to sort of engage our volunteers in sharing their knowledge, sharing their um their passion and gather a collective movement that way through crowdfunding and through things like that, looking at new ways that they can show their, share their passion and we can use them as sort of a, a spokesperson within their community because they can reach places we'll never reach. So I guess it's just tap, cracking their head open and tapping into those networks rather than getting them to be the ones on the, the front lines, really. And that's really that's sort of my... Sorry, that's me. I was going to say that was great. Thank you very much. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I thought you were... No, I'm done. No, I'm done. Sorry. That's good. Um, I was going to just open, open the question out really for a wider discussion. Um, uh, first of all, have, has anybody got any specific questions for any of our speakers at this stage? No. Okay, well, then I was going to ask then, would anybody. Sean, else? Has, Sean has his hand oh, up there. Sean has his hand up. I can't see him. I'm so sorry. Sean, do you want to ask your question? Unmute, Sean. Sean, you're on mute. <laughs> That's become the new phrase of our world now. Sean, you're on mute. <laughs> Can you manage? Down the left hand corner, there's a wee button. Oh, God, yes, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah um, go ahead. Well, firstly, I'd just like to thank the speakers there. Um, it's a way, it, it, it's an organization that we wouldn't have a lot of contact, a very little contact with the next the Fulton regulator and the, the, the Fulton Institute. Um, but because of the, 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 the different organizations, some of the people work with, it was very interesting to hear some of the comments there. Um, um, one of the concerns we that we've come across recently it's more directed towards the charity commission, but uh, in terms of groups being able to hold their AGMs and stuff like that, and put you know the governance stuff. But also, you know, there are concerns uh, in, in the area where, where I'm based um, about, unfortunately, about scams and people, you know, and older people, unfortunately, have to target a lot of these scams, you know. But it, it was very interesting to hear um, the last bit of there, Matt talking about, um, you know, the where we're going in the future, um, about um, you know, like street collections and bagpacks, which are, you know, are a big thing for a lot of local groups here in, in Uri, and particularly um, you know, youth groups and uh, sporting groups and that, you know. But I, I, I just like if um, Joanne earlier was saying about the updating the guidance, but just if any indication when the guidance may be. You know, circulate it, you know. Sean, we're hoping to get that out as soon as we can. I, I think there's just, uh, 
there's just a little bit of still continuing to proof it because things are moving so quickly around it. And yeah. um, but like I said, um, I mean registering your email with us will mean you'll get direct update on that when the guy right, is available. And then whenever you get a chance to have a look at it, I'm encouraging people okay, to that's brilliant. Uh, have I'll a discussion that. with me or whatever if there's particularly aspects around it. Yeah. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks, Joanne. Joanne, will the guidance cover things like backpacks and uh, cash handling and things like that when it comes out? Is it going into that level of detail? It, it's more about the face-to-face -face stuff and more about the review you might want. Yeah, and um, for any just just to kind of add there, Sean, if um, we have been having we've had a series of virtual networking events essentially. And just to kind of keep in touch with our um, with our members and non-members, um, and I would just say the same as Joanne, uh, we have a virtual event next Thursday, and um, we tend to do it between lunch time, just because then it means if anybody is working, it's just easier for them to dip in and dip out. Um, I'm happy to share. I've been in the past wholesale campaigns around face-to-face -to -face stuff. It's maybe thinking yeah. about and individual the details with the, uh, Denise, uh, and Denise can send them out to you guys, right. um, delegates who are on this call just, today. Nadine, sorry, um, you're just breaking up. Could you just hold on a wee minute, Nadine, and I'll let Joanne finish. She just uh, um, uh, broke out there. Joanne, sorry, um, you had um, uh, your connection had dropped out for a wee okay. second. Do you want to go back over that last point you were making? I was just making the point about phasing. Uh, again, or you know, uh, a structured way of introducing stuff on a on a on a on a much smaller scale for some organisations, not going with a wholesale campaign, but thinking about individually how they work that through. So, um, but happy to share that through your good offices as well uh, at Volunteer Now, and then we'll obviously be thinking about the wider comms and that along with the Chartered Institute as well. Yes, so we're happy to share from either of yourselves. Um, Nadine, sorry for interrupting you. Do you want to go back over your point there now? Oh, you're on mute. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, just to let these all know that we have been having our own virtual uh, events and we're, all, we're due to have our next one now next Thursday. Um, and that will kind of focus on the virtual fundraising events, if you like. And we'll, we're we're going to have a we're hopefully going to have a speaker on there talking about how they've done. Um, I don't want to say too much in case in case they can't come on to it, but um, we're hopefully going to have a speaker there talking about virtual quizzes and stuff. So um, you know, if anybody wants to come on to that, I'll share the details with Denise now, and then Denise can share it with the delegates on the call here today. And pretty much like yourself, what Joanne had said. If you sign up to our newsletter on the um, Chartered Institute of Fundraising website, you will get our newsletter. We've literally just sent out an email today. Um, we're trying to keep as people engaged as much as we can and share things across, um, you know, from what we're hearing from not only our members, but also from all our experiences or our sales. Uh, you know, we all work for very different and diverse charities, but I think the common, the common, um, the commonality between all of us is that most of our volunteers are older, um, so a lot of that is going to impact on our day-to-day -day workings. And just kind of want to reiterate what Matt said. You know, it is all about stewardship. We've done very similar. We've picked up the phone, we've rang them, we've checked in with them to see how they are, um, because for a lot of our older volunteers, this is their. You know, it, it is a sense of purpose for them. It gives them a purpose. It, it's a sense of connection for them as well. So it's really about just honing in on that and keeping that relationship going because we don't know what the future is going to look like, but at least whenever we have a better idea, whether it's through the guidance from the fundraising regulator or whether it's through our own discussions and our own kind of discoveries through forums such as this, then at least then we know that we've we've kept those volunteers engaged to a certain point. Um, and some of those volunteers are actually availing of our own services as well now. So, you know, um, I think there's just a point there, but I'll share the details of Denise with the with the virtual coffee catch up next Thursday between one and two, and you are all welcome to join in the conversation. Um, I think it's been quite cathartic for everybody that's taken part in it today. To date. Thanks, Nadine. That's great. Um, has anybody else got a question or a comment at this stage? It'd be really interesting to hear from anybody who's been doing something different with their volunteers. 
during the period of lockdown. Oh, Sean, you've got your hand up again. But you're, you're on mute still, so. Yeah, go. Yeah, last Thursday uh, afternoon, uh, the Confederation of Community Groups, we have um, quite a number of volunteers and quite a number of them are, are over 60 um, and older. And we have like a, a like a mini call centre normally in, in Balabal House where we were based and the volunteers have all been working and, and keep running our uh, services from home um, in terms of uh, contacting older people and carers and stuff. Um, last Thursday for part of volunteers, what we did last week, not me, but my colleagues did last week and I joined, we all joined in uh, to, to yeah, it's engaging. We all there was about thirty people on the screen more at one time, and and just thanking the volunteers uh, for all their work. And then we also had uh, one of my colleagues uh, is a bit of a musician, and he did a, a bit of uh, showing them how to play the bones and a lot of traditional music. And then we had a, a singer songwriter called Matt McGinn. I don't know if he's ever heard of him, but he um, he recorded a song. Uh, a version of the old Kent song, you know that one. Um, Thank you for the day, and um, he that was played, and um, and it, it was just, people were just sharing stories and songs in the back rack, and the feedback from that's been on on real, you know. So. That's lovely. Yeah, that's a little really good thing. But it's really important, and I think I've been really heartened by the conversation this morning about the importance of keeping connected with volunteers because that's something that we are really aware of and that you know many of those people who've been volunteering sometimes for decades for organizations it is actually a really important part of their lives and if they're not able to come back to volunteering and um, I, I was a uh, part of a conversation with the BBC this week they're going to do a feature on this next week and one of the people that they had interviewed is a 92 year old lady who has been volunteering in the same charity shop for the last 20 odd years and she's not now in a position to go back to volunteering and it's a really big loss for her i mean she's not going to have the same social outlets and things that she had before and you can imagine that for someone like that it can be really social isolation um issue and so i think it is important and it's really heartening to hear organizations taking the time to to keep linkedin with their older volunteers we have um, been trying to get some really clear guidance for groups around the issue of volunteering am among over 70s in particular um, because the English government, the British government has been updating national guidance and so we've been working with the Department for Communities here to see if we can get our local guidance to be just a bit clearer. I mean basically what they, it seems to boil down to is that older people, people over 70, people who um, can, can go out um, and that's very clearly what the First Minister said in her press conference a number of weeks ago. They can go out, but they need to maintain social distancing and they need to be aware of, you know, not um, damaging their own health or other people's. However, the caveat to all of that is, and it will be in the guidance, is that people who are over 70 are more prone to infection through COVID-19 and they're also more prone to complications as a result. And so they need to bear that in mind. Um, and I am hearing from a couple of different organisations that they have been struggling to get insurance cover, uh, particularly for that older age group. So I, I don't know how that's going to land. I mean, that's an emerging landscape in terms of insurance cover. I don't think anybody's clear how that's going to work out um, over the coming weeks and months. But it's certainly something that, that we're beginning to hear that there are some challenges with. So um, just to bear that in mind. But I expect the DFC um, updated statement in relation to that volunteering piece um, uh, to be probably today or tomorrow. Um, uh, they, they're still just working on it. And I think it will be signed off in the next sort of 24, 48 hours. So that, that's good. At least that will give a wee bit more clarity um, on, on that issue. And, and I mean, I think it's also just thinking about how we're doing things like risk assessments. I think Matt mentioned that as well. Um, you know, everything, the landscape's just completely different. So every single part of the volunteering relationship needs to be looked at again. So um, you know, that, that from, from the point of view of recruitment through to induction to training, we're also hearing lots of organisations looking at doing their training online. Um, and, and those kinds of things and, and that's going to be new challenges for for all of us and um, i do see um a question there um in relation to sort of yes if somebody else is just saying that 
um, they are doing their very best to kind of keep up to date with their volunteers and to, to maintain that contact. And that's really, really important. And and yes, also lovely feedback there about people really enjoying the social media tributes that groups have been doing. I don't know if you saw our hats off to volunteering last week, one, uh, which, you know, of course, I was the star of, but clearly the dog had nothing to do with it. But um, I think I think it's important to always just be trying to do different things. and. Uh, and keep that link um, with 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 the um, organisation. Jane, did you have a question? Sorry. Say that from Rosie as well too. That it's um, to the students, keeping students involved, um, and through WhatsApp has worked really well. Um, and, and also about the social media, but also um, Rosie was saying there too about keeping in touch. She, their organisations being keeping in touch with phone and texts, and um, to help them feel more connected with the organisation. So that um, is happening really well. Um, we've also heard about young people who have been art students who are selling their artwork for their for charities and for organisations. Just trying to think of creative ways of, of um, fundraising and of supporting the organisations that they would have been involved with before, um, and that has worked well for them and um, has raised some income. There was a young, I think, 16, 17 year old that had raised over 300 pounds for her local organisation. So, um, and her artwork was amazing. Um, and I've been doing that through Gumtree and eBay and different places. So, um, yeah, very good. Matt, any, anybody else got any Matt, stories please. that they'd like to share? Sorry, say again. Matt wants to come in next. Oh, no, oh, just a very quick point. I know, I think just based on that last point, I think it's a very important. Um, there's so many, there's such little things you can do that can go a long way for our volunteers, for our older volunteers, that sense of tradition like i don't want to say hierarchy but what we've been doing is getting short messages from our chief executive just thanking them and for a younger generation that may not have hold the credence or sway but i know for our older supporters who've been there a long time that small thing is such an important thing and i think for fundraisers i think it's just important to look at the long termism of this it's you know we're all struggling financially we well the 48 percent of voluntary income is down we expect but I guess these small gestures, I just I keep hammering this home, but it's just the importance of those small little gestures now will go such a long way into next year of when people come out the other end of this and they, they see who cared and see who supported them and see who was there for them, that that will go such a long way. So I just think it's it's, it's a two-way street of thinking inwardly of how you replace your income but out in the short term, but outwardly how we sort of progress this um, long term. Yeah, I would definitely reiterate that. Definitely. Um, I mean, last week for Volunteers Week, we um, we sent out letters and um, cards to every volunteer for the organisation. Now we would do that anyway, but we made a real point of making sure that those went out and they were all handwritten. Um, because you know, Harp, just go back to what Matt said there. It's a personal touch. Um, because. You know, we are a volunteer-led organisation within H&I. You know, we launched a new um, service at the start of this, and um, it's all volunteer-led. Um, so for us, really, it's been really important to keep that communication going and um, to, to kind of make people feel that they do have a purpose and they do have a role. So, yeah, I would definitely say, you know, even just simple things, picking up the phone, having a quick phone call with one of them just to make sure that they're all right. Um, because they are an extension of your organisation and sometimes they're the lifeblood of the organisation, really. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Thank you. Anybody else got any other ideas that they want to share just about maintaining contacts with their and saying thank you to their existing volunteers? Hi. Sorry, I don't know your name. Sonia. It doesn't Sorry, I, I, I joined a different link. It's Sonia from Fermana Trust. So that's who I am. Hello, um, I just, so I, I'm new coming into this. We've set up a Connect Fermana. It's called in Enniskillen and the Fermana area. Um, about 28 volunteers at the moment, but just in terms of keeping it really simple. I've sort of done a, you know, every Thursday I send them out a, a happy email. So it's like happy Thursday and a few inspirational quotes and things like that, that they seem to like and little bits that can find of the internet sort of positive statements and things, but also like little links to maybe a wee bit of online training or wee things that might be of interest or new things out there. But we sat and hand made some cards. So we actually sat with my children and we cut out cards and we stuck them and made handmade cards and hand wrote them. So I've got we messages back from all and they really appreciate it. Just it didn't cost a lot, but I think they all really appreciated the effort and the time that went into it. So it didn't cost very much, but I think they really valued the time it went into it. So it's just thinking a wee bit simply, but putting time and effort into everything you do and doing it well. And I think they get it. That's, That's a lovely idea. 
sent like a really well received uh, thing. That's a lovely thing to do for Volunteers Week. Anybody else? Just I'm just spooling across. It's quite hard to see everybody all at one one time on 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 this. I suppose um one of the things that I have been hearing as well is about thinking about you know okay if you need to recruit new volunteers. I suppose we we um we have had a huge number of people register with us. I mean when I say huge, I'm talking about over four thousand people have registered um in that period through through April and early May uh, with Volunteer Now. And so I would just put a uh, we mentioned that if you are thinking about refreshing your volunteers, don't forget to talk to Jane and her colleagues. Um, because there are people there who are asking for opportunities and looking for, for opportunities to help. Um, and so it's it's well worth uh, signing up with our B Collective platform and, and putting um, those opportunities out there because I know um, a number of organisations I can see around the table have had really good success in terms of recruiting volunteers through that platform over the last number of months. And I think it would be well worth thinking about that. But again, you still have to be very clear about the quality of the app, of the opportunity. You need to be thinking about how you're giving volunteers a positive experience, even if you are developing new roles and trying to recruit new volunteers. That's all, you know, really, really important. Um, as just before, as we begin to wrap up here, I'm just conscious of our time. Um, it, has anybody got any other stories or ideas or thoughts that they want to share or questions at this stage? No. OK, well, look, I, I just want to say um, a big thank you for joining us today and thank particularly um, Joanne and Paul and Nadine and Matt who have shared their experience with us. With us. Thank you all for um, coming along today and, and for joining. Uh, Jane has put her email address into the chat there, jane.gribbon at volunteernow.co.uk, but we will email that round. Um, just in case you are thinking of, of of getting some more or advertising for some more volunteers, Jane's the person to help. Um, we're also doing, um, just for those of your interest, we're doing a webinar now in uh, the next couple of weeks and we'll send you some information uh, in partnership with Inspire. And that's particularly for support for volunteers who have been uh, doing telephone befriending. So if any of you are running those check-in and chat services, it's really to look at how you're supporting your volunteers because uh, what we're really hearing is that, you know, it's obviously a great strain for people and they can be hearing some quite harrowing stories and it's really how you look after and support volunteers in that space. So um, one of the psychologists from Inspire is, is going to be delivering that session for us and I think that's the week after next. So again, there's more information about that on, on our website. But it just remains for me to say thank you to Julianne for all of her work behind the scenes and um, for, for, for all of you for joining us this morning. Just uh, look after yourselves and, and take care um, in the next uh, coming weeks. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.